So hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Money Talk, where we help make personal finance and investing simple and accessible through both my own personal experience. I've been doing this for about twenty years now, uh, and through the expertise of my guests. And today we have a uh, one such expert guest, which is Varun Fateh Puriya, who's the founder of Dollar, and Dollar is a wealth management platform. So he's going to be talking to us a little bit about how an individual investor can construct a diversified portfolio, which is also customized to their needs. Uh, but first, before we begin, may I request you to quickly follow this show uh, so that you don't miss any of the great content that we have coming up. Uh, and if you do like this episode, and I'm sure that you will, please do rate us five stars. It helps us a lot. So thanks a lot for that. Uh, so Varun, thank you so much for being with us uh, here today. uh before we start maybe you could introduce yourself you know your background in uh, money management and investing and also tell us more about dollar it sounds uh, very interesting by the way for those of you who are not based in india dollar actually means uh, money or wealth uh, yeah, and yeah. so that's why it's a very appropriate name for a wealth management service right thank you so much for having me amit on the show right i was really looking forward to this one uh so just as a quick introduction i'm actually a finance professional by training um i went to hong kong and italy for my undergraduate studies uh and pursued a degree in uh finance and information systems quite honestly i think uh, uh prior after subsequent to my studies i actually also spent a year working with blackstone which is uh, the world's largest alternative the asset management firm in the real estate private equity team right. um, and prior to that i also had some experience working with bloomberg um, in the equity research department so really i think that was the starting point for me in terms of you know finance and money management in general right i mean both of these experiences individually and cumulatively not just allowed me to be in a global financial center like hong kong but also really just get a front row uh, view and see it in terms of how these big institutions actually thought about investing really what sort of a tools and software did they use what sort of a people did they hire so that really helped actually in setting the tone in terms of how i actually want to approach investing um, uh, and stuff so that that really helped me actually you know get into this whole money management thing yeah and in fact uh, you worked in uh i would say the the big name uh companies in yeah. this particular space so uh that's been i'm sure that was formative to you know to dollar than what you actually decided to now do so tell us more about uh, dollar itself uh what are you trying to do what's the purpose really of of uh, the company yeah i think dollar you know just i mean uh uh just goal over here is to just quite honestly it's very simple just to help indians invest better right i mean we mm -hmm. try to put this whole investing thing into a lot more perspective and structure which honestly i think if you ask me got a bit lost in the last 18 to 24 months uh due to this i would say whatever covid induced bull market right i mean right. obviously it ended up being this double edged sword which actually helped a lot of people come into the markets experience you know what investing is uh and stuff but also created this wrong set of notion and expectations in their mind right and pretty much they saw a market which just traveled in only one direction up and to the right so they basically had this notion that you could pretty much you know just lie down on the couch uh hit a few buttons here and there and pretty much that's it i mean investing is done right but i think people who have spent time studying investing spent time in the markets would actually appreciate uh investing is just more than that i mean it's a whole uh, discipline in and by itself it actually requires a lot of study and research so we try to basically actually provide that uh customized solutions uh to our investors where we actually just take care uh of the heavy lift heavy lifting of investing so thinking about risk tolerance thinking about asset allocation thinking about how actually portfolios needs to be constructed uh do the portfolios need to you know change over time so they that they are in sync with the market uh stuff like that uh and we just you know present a customized uh, all in one solutions to the investor so they don't have to think about 
all of those things. Uh, and also, I think what we had seen roughly, right? I mean, obviously, the first 18 months, pretty much everyone was doing fine. But in the last six months, the kind of downturn that we're actually seeing in the markets, I think at that point in time, people started realizing, you know, maybe, hey, maybe I need uh, someone like an expert or someone who does this full time to help me out with how do you actually um, go through situations like these. So that, that that's really dollar for us. Yeah, I, I think you've, you've hit upon a couple of important points here. I think in the last 18 months or 24 months, like you said, uh, the world has been a very strange place. And in fact, while a lot of people may have been enticed into the market, <clears throat> they would have been enticed at the time when it began to boom. And so therefore, they're probably facing the brunt of that now that uh, yeah. things have started to tank. Uh, but it was also a very good time for a patient uh, investor to have got in. So, for example, in March, April 2020, when, you know, everything really crashed, uh, was an excellent time to get into buying stocks um, because, you know, you, you would have taken the benefit of the entire uh, upswing uh, after that. And it's an interesting thing about markets, which is, so, so I've been investing for a while. Um, I would say off and on. I'm not, I'm not a very heavily, uh, you know, focused investor in the sense I like to buy and hold. And so therefore, you know, when March, April came, I took the opportunity to get in and, you know, for, I would say for about 12 months, it was great. Uh, and then the thing is that because I'm a buy and hold kind of person, I don't have a very good entry plan. I don't have a very good exit plan. And so yeah. therefore, you know, the market went up and then it went down and I went up and down along with it. I'm still, I think, uh, come out overall positive uh, and actually fairly decently positive. But uh, it is a fact that, you know, for most people, uh, you don't have the time or frankly even the inclination to sit around managing this all the time and trying to figure yeah. out what's the macroeconomics and then what's your stock and all of that. So a service like uh, Dalit, uh, I'm, I'm sure actually helps a lot of people who are savvy but not, uh, you know, don't have that much time or uh, energy to put into this. So tell me a bit more about how uh, how you came about this because you were obviously working in great companies, you would have made a fair amount of health uh, yourself if you had continued working mm -hmm. there. Uh, so why do all of this? Uh, again, I think one of the points that you alluded to Amit previously, right? I mean, this whole concept of if you would have stayed invested during March and April of 2020, I mean, obviously, if you go through a standard risk profiling questionnaire, maybe at that point in time, it would be easy for you to answer that, yeah, hey, maybe I can take that 20% drop in portfolio value, right? But it actually starts to occur. I think at that point in time, do you actually start realizing maybe, you know, the, the kind of uh, asset allocation that we have and so on and so forth? Probably it is not for me. And maybe even if you would have selected it at that point in time, perhaps you need some sort of a comfort uh, from a human, right? Uh, right. To basically actually comfort you that maybe, you know, things will pass by uh, if your portfolio is in uh, good stead. But honestly, I think how I actually got into dollar this. So I've been personally investing my own wealth, uh, whatever level that I had with my first check for the past four to five years, right? I mean, I fairly uh, did okay, given my experience. Um, and at that point in time, that sort of like also slowly graduated from managing my own uh, money to managing my friends and families corpus, uh, so on and so forth. So I've been doing this for about four or five years right now. I mean, didn't really have, so to speak, a grand plan to uh, <laughs> get into this space, quite honestly. Obviously, I think from the outside financial services industry uh, in a country like India, where financial literacy continues to be abysmally low, at least compared to its uh, counterparts in the US or the Europe or even for that matter in China, right? It continues to be low. So obviously, there is an opportunity for you to come in uh, and maybe provide solutions which could help the average investor. It's just that maybe for me, I was uh, not finding the right opportunity, so to speak. And perhaps also it was a bit of a leap of a faith uh, to come back from Hong Kong and, and you know, uh, start really uh, doing something in India. Mm -hmm. uh, so so um, honestly, that's, that's basically how it uh, really started. I mean, I think as COVID hit in March, 20 April 2020, right? I mean, started getting a lot of these calls from my friends and family asking, you know, hey, what should I be doing at this point in time? Are my portfolios correct? Is this a good time to actually double down? So on and so forth. So I think that that's when you actually start realizing that obviously I think DIY apps and stuff have made the entire transactional part really easy, but it's 
when you're managing something as personal as one's wealth, right? I mean, you need at that point in time, some level of human intervention to manage that. So that's really, I would say, where the whole idea of a dollar really started to germinate. I mean, at that point in time, I was still going and speaking to investors, seeing how I could just, you know, potentially help them. And what you ended up seeing is this basically whole ad hoc portfolios that had been created with no sort of an agenda, no sort of a perspective structure put in place. So maybe uh, as I went and spoke to a lot of people, I think at that point in time where I started to realize that maybe, you know, this is something uh, that could be take, taken up upon. Right. You, you mentioned that uh, during this whole, uh, whatever, the ups and downs of the market recently is when people started reaching out to you. I'm sure there were some uh, panic calls <laughs> as well. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, when you see a portfolio, I mean, uh, during a course of a week, you're seeing pretty much a portfolio drop over 20%, right? I mean, it's pretty much hard earned money for you that you're saved for five years, 10 years. I mean, so no, no amount of literature can basically just tell you that, yeah, I'll be fine with it. Obviously it's jittery. You sort of like, you see overnight your portfolio uh, value just crashing uh, with the, the amount of uh, velocity that it did, right? So yeah, that that's basically then gets a bit touchy. Yeah, and I think it's underrated the amount to which psychology plays a role in investing. Uh, I mean, of course, there's now a very popular book, The Psychology of, of Money. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, it's only when you do it and then you go through it. Uh, I mean, go through the down, go through a downturn, not uh, upwards. Everybody's happy. But uh, only when you go through a downturn, do you truly know what you're like as an investor? Um, yeah. And uh, I think people don't appreciate that until they actually go through a downturn. And the mm -hmm. challenge is that over the last 10 years, pretty much, um, there's not been a sort of definitely a prolonged downturn. There have been corrections, but there's not been a major drop, like let's say 2008 or 2000 or, or something like that. Um, right. Or in India for that matter, 2003, uh, which is when I first coincidentally started investing was a period where I think the, uh, there was an, it was an election and the government changed in an unexpected fashion and the stock market tanked and Coincidentally, I was just getting into the market at that time. Yeah. So I took advantage of the drop uh, back then. So uh, I think people yeah, don't sure. quite get it, uh, you know, without having gone through it. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of investing actually also has to do with the temperament, right? I mean, if, if you have the right temperament to actually see through that entire uh, market cycle, so to speak. I mean, you're there in the ups and the downs. Are you able to sort of like withstand that volatility? And I think a lot of it also, I think at least especially people in the younger generation, right? Because a lot of the apps have made it really easy to just go right. and pick stocks, right? I mean, there is this itch to somehow uh, make it believe that you could do better than someone who's doing this for a living. So you just go on an app, you see, okay, I'm just going to go and buy this large cap stock, this mid cap stock, this multi bagger, this hot thing, so on and so forth. Uh, and, and, and I think that's, that's where a lot of the problems actually also uh, stems from this desire to constantly keep busy with investing, this desire to constantly think that you are probably adding value to what you're doing, which perhaps you would not be. Uh, so that's, 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 I think where I would say you need uh, people to actually come and calm you down. And just obviously also just stems from the trust that you want to have uh, in people that's uh, doing this. Yeah, it's, uh, it's effectively FOMO. The only news that you're going to see when markets are going up is news is good news. Yeah. Nobody's going to tell you about uh, the losses they've made in an upward trending market. They're only going to talk about their wins. Then you feel like everybody around you is winning. So therefore right. you should also get in. Uh, and similarly on the other way, on the other way as well, when things are going down, the only news you'll hear is doom and gloom and uh, everything's going to hell, right. uh, which, and neither is, is re ever really true. People are making money when things are going down. People are losing money when things are going up, but those are not newsworthy. And so that's why people, tend to get in a bit late, I guess, because of FOMO and also get out uh, uh, maybe potentially too early or something when, you know, things are not going very well. So, uh, so I think all of this points to maybe, I think what you're trying to say here is that if you adopt an ad hoc approach to doing things and your everything is DIY and everything is simplified, you're probably making uh, sort of a, a patchwork of things versus something that has some sort of structure and logic to it. So, uh, and, and I know that's really the core of what we're going to talk about today. So, uh, so what is, um, what is it that 
uh, you know enables this i mean you know people talk about uh, maybe uh, sort of a disciplined approach maybe is is that what you are uh, talking about yeah uh, i mean when i talk about let's say again a lot of like disciplined approach that i'm talking about right i mean uh, essentially when you just go and really speak to people right i mean these could be even first time investors who again got into the markets uh, for the last two years or even more seasoned investors who have been investing through an old school broker or a distributor for the last 10 15 years mm. i think even though the psychology of both the investors uh, continue to be very different uh, the underlying sort of like the problem remains the same where again there's an ad hoc portfolio approach so uh, let me sort of like just give you an example right people have this sort of like notion of diversification right so now i think intuitively they would think that if they invested across 10 funds they're diversified hmm. i mean but essentially if all of those 10 funds end up holding the same stock or at least let's say even 60 to 70% of it i mean you're not diversified i mean you hmm. could go and invest in five large cap funds four small cap funds in the name of diversification but you need to put that into a lot more structure you need to think about okay what sort of an asset classes exposure that you have how much of an exposure do you have to that is that in sync with what's happening currently uh, and then that sort of like forms the basis of actually how do you construct portfolios i mean you'll be surprised to know i mean i sort of like feel a bit sad saying this but there are countless number of people who are investing 20 30 40 funds in the name of diversification and it's not that they have been sort of like they're doing it by purpose is just that they have been fed with so much of information just by the virtue of reading it on the net or being uh, taken that 70th call from their bank's rm telling that sir go and please buy this this is going to give you x percent of return in the next two years so you just keep on doing that and over a period of time you sort of like left with this hot potato uh, that essentially is not even beating the benchmark So again, when we talk about portfolio construction, obviously we start from the basics. We start from the ground up, and happy to speak a bit more about that. Yeah, in fact, uh, one other driver of all of this is tax savings. So uh, at the time when you're going to file your taxes, you suddenly do this last-minute mm-hmm. mutual fund investment because you're trying to maximize your savings over there, and that's also going to be some very random thing which you did two days before the filing deadline. and that tends to also i think proliferate this problem so let's talk a bit more about uh, portfolio construction itself right so how so maybe just walk me through step by step perhaps like if i were now if let's say i had uh, i'm let's say i'm an early career sort of person so i have 10 lakh rupees investable or maybe mm-hmm. 20 lakh rupees investable um what uh, and again for those who are not in india 10 lakhs is about 20000 well about 15000 us dollars and uh, 20 lakhs would be worth 30000 us dollars so let's say i have that kind of a corpus how am i how should i be thinking about portfolio yeah sure amit uh, so i think a couple of things obviously i think helps in setting the tone and the expectation in really keeping your portfolio in a more uh, solid footing right obviously i think when you're looking at investing you need to ask a couple of questions to yourself number one what's really the time horizon i think that really sort of forms the bedrock uh, when we are thinking about how do we actually go about constructing portfolios a lot of the answers will stem from what really is the time horizon how long can you really stay invested in the markets because let's be honest this is not a gambling approach where pretty much overnight you can have your money doubled or at least do that consistently over a period of time so you need to understand uh, what sort of a time horizon do you have and number two are you really saving towards a goal whether that could be a down payment for your house whether that could be saving up for a child's education or just generally even if you don't really have a goal per se i think it's just good that even if you're investing for general you have those questions in your mind so once we have that in place obviously then sort of like comes the question of okay how much risk can you actually take and i think pretty much in a bull market i think when you go and talk about risk you end up looking silly i mean people do not want to talk about risk they do not understand the risk and they they're like i don't want to have to do anything with risk right i mean just give me something which gives me the best returns fine you can have that but what happens in a situation again like march or april of 2020 or just really what we are seeing in the last 6 to 8 months do you have the temperament do you have sort of like that mindset to actually withstand that 
And maybe a risk questionnaire could be a good shorthand for that. But if you've had the opportunity to actually live through moments where we have actually experienced that downturn, do ask yourself those questions that maybe am I actually set up to handle this much portfolio drop? So once we have these couple of questions in place, right, I think that sort of like helps in then deciding what sort of an asset allocation do you have? I mean, that really also is, uh, I would say, 101 of investing, right? And asset allocation simply, I think, uh, for the audience is just that how much of your money needs to be invested into different asset classes, whether that could be equities, whether that could be debt, whether that could be gold, or even within equities, that could be domestic equities, international equities. I think it's really important to actually put that into structure and actually align it with what your risk tolerance is. So let's say if you are or can tolerate a high amount of risk in the market, probably you'd be having a higher exposure to equities uh, just by the virtue of the nature of that asset classes, which tends to go up and down over a period of time. So it's just one, uh, one quick yeah. interjection. So, you know, when we talk about risk, I think the word risk uh, to a normal person has uh, sort of, a slightly different connotation Negative right connotation maybe ne yeah exactly whereas i think what what we mean here is more volatility yeah. so how much of up and down can you take so Absolutely. risk means so it's not like something is inherently risky uh, something which is high risk doesn't mean it's a risky thing in, in normal english the way we would think of it yeah. it just means that yes you can uh, it's going to go up and down wildly and so therefore, you could make a lot of money, you could lose a lot of money. So it's highly volatile and so higher risk within quotes. Whereas something else, uh, maybe your example of gold, perhaps less volatile over uh, longer periods, I guess. Uh, and so therefore, not so risky within quotes. But it doesn't mean it can't go down in, in value. I mean, gold does go down as well. Absolutely. I think yeah, inherently risk is not bad per se. I think it's just that your ability to actually withstand that roller coaster, right? So mm -hmm. maybe let's say if you have... Uh, want to invest for a longer period of time obviously i think sort of like that risk level actually smoothens out so you just that you need to give that asset class that amount of time mm. so that you are able to get the kind of returns that you are expecting from the risk or whatever that movements that you're actually undertaking so that that's basically yeah uh, what we actually mean by risk yeah also the the point of time is a, is a good one things can be highly volatile in the short term but directionally uh, you know, up and to the right in the yeah. longer term. Uh, unless you get extremely unlucky and you bought at such a weird point of, uh, you know, history where it's going to take like decades to recover to whatever level it was at. But generally speaking, I think even equity stocks and all that, even if things look like doom and gloom right now, in the long run, stocks have performed fairly well. And so in most points of time, if you entered and you had a long-term horizon, you'd make better money than you might make with uh, perhaps other forms of investment. Yeah, I mean, if history is any example, right, even if you go back last, whatever, three, four, five decades and start to look at the trajectory of how a typical stock market index, whether that's in India or the US or the Europe has performed, right, it's pretty much sort of like directionally has gone up. It's just that I think as soon as you start zooming in into those micro periods of three months, six months, mm. 12 months, maybe at that point in time, you could see those up and down. But let's say, let's be honest, if you're not, sort of like doing this for a living you're not an active trader you sort of like do not want to make money on a day-to-day -day basis it's pretty much sort of like you know good to just adopt a disciplined approach and let sort of like time take care of itself right okay so let's let's look at this hypothetical person who is uh, you know has this 10 lakh 20 lakh rupees to invest uh, how should how should they construct their like then there's a beginning investor right so yeah how would you think they should construct their portfolio? Again, I think, uh, again, alluding to the points that I made earlier, right? I think once you have an understanding of, let's say, how much of a risk can you tolerate, what sort of mm. a time horizon that you have, once we have those basic questions answered, we then get to the point where we start thinking about how much of a money should be allocated to different asset classes. So let's say just for uh, sort of argument's sake, you want to invest for a long period of time, you're fairly early into your professional career, you don't really have a lot of dependence on and so forth. So squarely, you would fit into the aggressive category, where obviously there's a much higher exposure to equities and riskier assets, as opposed to more stable and safer assets like debt um, or gold, even for that matter. Uh, 
So let's say we invest about 80 to 85 percent of your wealth in equities, right? And even in equities, there are multiple sub asset classes. So you could be invested into a large cap or a mid cap or a small cap stock, or you could be invested into international equities in the US or the Europe. And even within that, there are different styles of investing. So again, don't want to make it sound of like too technical, but it's just good to have an understanding that right. even within each of the asset classes, you need to have an understanding of what sort of an exposure do you have to each sub of that. So let's say once we have that sort of like formed up, right? About 75 to 80% of wealth is going towards equities. And then we come down a bit uh, deeper and then we think about debt, right? I mean, people typically think about debt as uh, investing again. They're pre- probably invested in debt in some form or the other, maybe in the form of a fixed deposit or a recurring deposit. Mm-hmm. It's just that those are also debt instruments, but they just tend to be extremely tax inefficient from a tax point of view. So once we have that uh, also formed up, right? How much of your money needs to be invested um, into debt? So maybe that's, let's say like 10%, and that's also invested across corporate bonds and sovereign bonds um, and public sector undertaking bonds. Uh, and then the final piece could be, let's say, gold, right? I mean, obviously, maybe you could have physical gold, but I think the purpose of including actual gold into the portfolio is just as a hedge. So let's, if we rewind about six months back in time, right? Let's say January, February of this year, and, and when sort of like we're seeing the geopolitical uncertainty due to the war, the rise in the oil prices, at that point in time, when a lot of people, investors actually started um, exiting equities, you could see the demand for gold actually started to right. go. So if you would have invested in uh, gold at that point in time, obviously you would have delivered a positive return. But just try to understand that gold is not there to sort of like give you that return. It's just from more of a hedge and a diversification point of view that you need to have these things um, in your portfolio. So once we have those things in place, that's when we talk about the portfolio being well diversified, right? I mean, a lot of the people also have this notion that just by the virtue of being diversified, even in true sense, means that uh, it's pretty much a guarantee return that you're going to generate. But that's not really the case. It's just that if you are into a well diversified portfolio, it's just that it's going to give you a more smoother or a relatively smoother investment journey than what you would have had uh, otherwise by being invested into just equities. So that's that's how basically I would you know encourage people uh, who have uh, that amount of purpose to invest that let's try and put these things into structure. Let's try to think about how much risk can you take, what sort of an asset allocation you have, and then build towards uh, constructing a portfolio. Uh, rather than just taking an ad hoc approach and going to a money control or something like that and just buying based on whatever you have read or heard. Right. Uh, Actually, one other question over here, Varun. So for a lot of people, uh, you know, they buy property, at least one, you know, their whatever the home that they're going to live in. Uh, Now that doesn't fall into the typical wealth management portfolio construct. Uh, But how do you view that, uh, you know, in terms of comparing with equity, debt, gold, or... Like in which part of their portfolio should people think of uh, real estate? Yeah, I mean, so again, real estate as an asset class, again, I mean, whether you're holding actual physical real estate, right? And I think a lot of the people who who, are, who tend to be a bit more older uh, tend to value the importance of seeing something tangible in value. But what mm-hmm. they typically tend to forget that real estate as an asset class tends to be extremely illiquid. It's just that when you actually need the money, you'd probably need another six to 12 months of time to be able to get rid of that, right? So I think people uh, in the younger generation sort of like do not ascribe as much value to real estate as let's say people, um, a generation above them would have, right? So uh, in the US uh, and Europe as well, right? I mean, there's uh, another uh, sort of like you can get exposure to real estate through what is known as a real estate investment trust, REITs, right? Essentially, I think REITs are similar to mutual funds in that in mutual funds, you get exposure to um, equity uh, or the stock of the company. And in REITs, you get basically exposure to real estate as an asset class. Mm -hmm. So if you do want to have real estate as part of your portfolio, and for sure, it's a good portfolio diversifier, uh, it's always a good idea to, let's say, consider uh, having REIT in your portfolio. So that can sort of like, you know, give you exposure to the real estate asset classes without going through that entire process of actually going and buying a property, making sure it's in 
uh, line uh, being illiquid, so on and so forth. So those actually, the REITs as an asset class actually strips out uh, and takes away all the hassle of actually owning a physical property. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, the other question I have is uh, with in relation to Bitcoin specifically, uh, because a lot of people call Bitcoin digital gold because it's uh, limited in quantity, uh, more limited in fact than gold probably is. So any views on on that? Is it really digital gold? Like, can you use that instead of uh, gold? I think obviously, I think uh, people will sort of like come after me for saying that, but it's, it's been sort of like the cool thing to do, right? I mean, the, for the last four to five years, if you have a conversation with your friends or family, obviously people would ask you, hey, are you invested into Bitcoin? And, and, and sort of like, if you do not, um, say yes to that answer, probably people will raise an eyebrow as to, okay, what is this guy trying to do, right? Obviously, I think people have got into Bitcoin in the last four to five years, primarily because of it being a very speculative asset. And obviously, most of the people who had invested in 2016, 70, pretty much got a multifold returns uh, in excess of whatever, like 50 times, 100 times of the investment, right? Hmm. But um, for us as well, and for me personally, I sort of like do not currently i'm unable to see a lot of value in terms of we want to understand what the actual underlying economic thesis of bitcoin is where it is actually deriving value from and is it just a case of you know unlimited demand and finite supply mm. i mean if that's the case obviously then you will have something or have an asset which goes up but is there a fundamental underlying uh economic reason to the way it is actually performing so so that's i mean if you want to have exposure to bitcoin as an asset classes uh, at best we would uh, sort of like you know recommend to have one to three percent of a portfolio again if you can sort of like withstand that but uh i think regulations are still not very clear because you're seeing sort of like this clamp down which is happening mm -hmm. all across asia um, and the kind of fall that we have seen in a lot of these crypto and Bitcoin in the last eight months again, right? So people are still trying to wrap their head around it. Maybe I think uh, it's, it's it's probably over time that we'll be able to find an answer to that. Right. Okay. I, I think that's a fair point. And uh, it's not behaving like a gold <laughs> at this yeah. point. It's behaving more like, a, like you said, a speculative uh, traded commodity, I guess, just like yeah. any other thing that you might be trading. Okay, so so thanks a lot, Varun. This was uh, this was really cool. Uh, I also like how you laid out the basics of portfolio management very simply. Uh, I think people think maybe the pe most people overthink this, and so therefore either they are not doing it at all, like you said, like you know just pray and pray, um, or they might think, oh my God, I have to do so much of math to figure out uh, what all of this is about. But I think what you are saying is at the end of the day, you have to understand. How will you react in the event of things going down? How you'll react when it goes up is, uh, I think, the same for everyone. Um, and given that kind of reaction, what sort of blend of things should you uh, should you invest in so that you it will not it will go down only to the levels which you can tolerate essentially. Absolutely. Uh, and that being the case, uh, you know, you 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 wait more towards highly volatile things if you're okay with that or you wait more towards less volatile things if you're not okay with so much fluctuation uh, and that's essentially the blend that you have to do and that's what Dalit will help you with essentially and uh, subsequent to that I suppose portfolios have to keep being updated because markets move and you know the weightage might change uh, is that something also that uh, that you would do yeah, so obviously, I think portfolio itself do not remain static, right? I mean, probably pretty much what you have on day one, day one would not sort of like look the same um, at the end of five years or 10 years down the line. And obviously, portfolios need to sort of like be in sync with what's happening in the markets. But what I would caveat that by saying is that you do not get into the mindset of being very active that on a day-to-day -day or a month-to-month -month mm. basis, you have that itch of doing something. Obviously, let that asset or let that portfolio sort of like be invested for a certain period of time. And if you do sort of like, you know, see or at least have a point of view as to where the economy is headed, what sort of a things are you seeing going on in the world, at that point in time, you could sort of like take a point of view. But again, do not sort of like uh have this urge of constantly being on top of the things uh all of the time and obviously it's not as complicated as maybe i would have made it sound but i think it's just that just um if you're going about a day-to-day -day job i think you're probably better off putting your energies into maximizing 
uh, what you do over there rather than thinking that investing is something as a part time and I can right. just uh, do it uh, casually and uh, uh, be done with it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, essentially, if you keep fiddling, then it defeats the purpose of having a portfolio because yeah. then you're just changing it all the time. Right. Uh, okay, so thanks, thanks so much, Varun. Uh, this was a really nice and enlightening conversation. Uh, I had a great time chatting with you today, uh, and I'm sure our listeners benefited a lot as well. Uh, so, so thanks a lot for being here, uh, and for those uh, who are listening to us today, uh, thank you also for joining us. Please do remember to follow the show and to rate this episode five stars. Uh, do check out Dalit if you are in the market to you know figure out uh, your own wealth management journey. Perhaps you might uh, be able to use the help. So uh, thanks for joining. We were Varun and Amit with Money Talk. See you next time. Thank you.